podcast of KTWR. Global Radio Ministries and Jaron Ministries International now brings you James, Man with a Message. This is a multi-part teaching series on the New Testament Epistle of James, taught by Dr. Jim Cece of Campus Bible Church in Fresno, California. First, Jessica Erickson sings, I Believe. Voices in my mind that say I'm not enough Every single lie that tells me I will never measure up Am I more than just a sum of every high and every low? Remind me once again just who I am because I need to know Think of me In you I find my worth In you I find my identity And I know this may be routine to those of you that are here in this audience, but we always want to make sure that we greet our radio listening audience, maybe for the very first times, and even our internet audience. Maybe somebody just came through in some way and landed and decided to, to, to land here this morning. Wouldn't that be great? Or maybe even six, seven, eight, ten years from now, somebody's listening to this podcast. We want to welcome you as well. We're just so grateful to God to be a part of the family of God all over the world. I know there are people in Romania listening to us as well. Of course, it's their evening service, and some of them are doing it in small groups as well. And so we're just blessed to have a local audience, and I would pray that God would just extend our global audience as well. Not because we're anybody, we're not. We just are a people who love the Lord Jesus Christ and love the Word of God. Amen? And with that in mind, will you turn, please, to the book of James? The next number of months, we're going to go verse by verse through this marvelous and incredible epistle. Probably the oldest of the New Testament letters. Written around 45 AD, just a few years before a gathering of the elders and the leaders of the church in a place called the Jerusalem Council. A very important time when they solved a problem that we're experiencing even today. That solution that we're celebrating as we gather this morning. Now, this epistle, the book of James, has been rightly called the letter to the 12 tribes. That's right there in the very first verse. And there's lots of debate as to, is it the 12 tribes of the dispersed nation of Israel and Judah? Uh, Or is it the 12 tribes symbolic of the new group of people of God called Christians, who are dispersed all over the world, and really, frankly, throughout the centuries, and here we are, and I personally believe that's it. That this book was written not just to them, but to us. Everybody say me. Because throughout this time, verse by verse, phrase by phrase, 108 verses in this five-chapter epistle, 
It's going to be about me and God and about us and the world. It's written to the people of God whose lives are not quite what they want them to be. Anybody in the room? Not quite what you want them to be. You want them to be better. The letter is broken into a number of sermonettes. Uh, and in fact, it's marvelously laid out in such a way that all of our, our pastor teachers are going to be able to break it down in such a way. And you're going to get the flavor not only of the book of James, but you're going to get the flavor of our pastoral team. And we're blessed to have a marvelous team. I love sitting under our other pastors and being taught by them. And you're going to find that this is a very Old Testament, New Testament book. And it deals with a number of subjects uh, that all of us can relate to. And frankly, all of us could say, I need that. In fact, what I want to do is give you an overview of the Epistle of James. And if it comes on a subject that you need, just whisper to yourself, I need that. That was written for me. In chapter 1, dealing with daily trials and the need for daily wisdom and the challenge of increasing wealth and overcoming moment-by-moment temptation and enjoying God's goodness and being doers and not just hearers of the word. I need that. And in chapter 2, resisting the sin of favoritism and prejudice, and loving our neighbors, and living by faith and works. Anybody? I need that. And as we come to chapter 3, taming the tongue, discerning earthly and versely wis- heavenly wisdom. In chapter 4, dealing with selfish desires and destructive pride and deadly judgmentalism. I need that. In chapter 5, dealing with daily greed and, a life, and living a life of perseverance and, and the healing power of prayer. And of course, restoring fellow sinners to fellowship with God. Everybody say, I need that. Who among us doesn't? And God's Spirit is going to use this 108 verse, 5 chapter letter, an epistle. You know what an epistle is. It's a letter. To you and to me. And the bottom line is this. It's going to challenge us as faithful followers to not just talk the talk, but to walk the walk. And that's why the theme of the letter is faith that works. Not just a faith that talks about it. A faith that does something about it. No wonder scholars refer to it as the New Testament book of wisdom. I like to call it Proverbs of the New Testament. I'm presently writing a book on the book of Proverbs that should be out probably by the end of this, next, this year. And since this book contains a, a remarkable parallel to Jesus' Sermon on the Mount, you're going to find that James quotes his brother more than anybody else in all of the New Testament. And in particular, Matthew 5, 6, and 7. So we can title it Reflections on the Sermon on the Mount. Kingdom living in the here and now. Especially my now. So with all that in mind, I want to get started with our exposition. And there's no way I can cover all 108 verses. That's going to take us many months, as you well imagine, here at Campus Bible Church. In fact, I'll barely get through verse 1 today. Let's read verse 1 together. Everybody join me, please. Read it from the New American Standard Version. That's the version we'll be preaching from. James, a bondservant of God. That started all over with all of us, everybody. James, a bondservant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ, to the twelve tribes who are dispersed abroad, greetings. And immediately you jump to verse 2. No, 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 no. I want to start with the very first word. James. Everybody say James. I want to introduce you to James, the man. Now, obviously, that's not a picture of James, but I just like it. But who is this man? Well, he's not the only one in the New Testament with the name James. There's three or four others. And there's a lot of debate, but I hold to the writings of Origen and Clement and Eusebius, these ancient historians, with the traditional view, based on what the Apostle Paul said in Galatians 1, verse 19, James, the Lord's brother. James. Now, our English Bible translated it that way, but really... The Hebrew name is Yaakov, all right, and, and it sounds like Jacob. We translate it also as James. I don't know how James got out of Yaakov, but that's how it is. It's a very common name then and now. How many of you are named Jacob or James? I am. That's my first name. But I want to talk about this man, because before we study his letter, don't miss the fact that God by the power of the Holy Spirit, moved using James's personality, his history, 
his own life experience to write exactly what the Spirit of God wanted us to hear. He wasn't some autotom, you know, he wasn't, this wasn't supernaturally dictated where James was in some robotic state and he just penned these words. No, no, no. God used James, so we better get to know James. His early life in particular. He was born in the first century A.D., just a few years after the birth of Jesus. But what's especially noteworthy is his very, very unique family. He was born in a Jewish family. You'll catch that in the flavor of the book. It's a very Jewish book, written in marvelous Greek. But he came from the family of Joseph and Mary. Sound familiar? Joseph and Mary of Nazareth in an area called Galilee. And you know that Joseph did not have sexual relations with Mary until after Jesus was born. He kept her a virgin. The virgin birth, we love to talk about. The incarnation of the Son of God. But James was the oldest child in the home after Jesus. He was the oldest natural born child of the union of Mary and Joseph. And, and listen to what Matthew's Gospel records in chapter 13, verse 55 and 56. Is this... Is not this Jesus the carpenter's son? Is not his mother called Mary and his brothers James and Joseph and Simon and Judas and his sisters, plural, are they not all with us? So here's what we've got so far is that James, or rather Jesus, had at least four other brothers and two other sisters at least. So some seven in that home. And so with parents, a minimum of a family of nine, which was very typical of the day. But wasn't what wasn't typical was the fact that one of them was the incarnate Son of God. That's got to change your family dynamic. Uh, let me ask this. How many of you had older brothers and sisters? Will you raise your hands? How many will be honest enough to say, and they were hard to live with? I, I will. I had two. I, I was, you know, five of six. In fact, that was my name. Five of, of six. You know, uh, my Christmas presents were hand-me-downs, you know? Uh, you know, it was the socks without the holes, you know? It was like, thank you. Old, how many of you know what hand-me-downism is? The others of you need to get a life, I'm sure. <laughs> so it was tough enough for me to live with, El with, with older brothers who thought they were God, <laughs> but to live with one who really was. Can you imagine? And we know from Scripture that Jesus says that he grew in wisdom and stature as the human Son of Man. Nonetheless, the divine Son of God. So he developed as a normal human child, but, and he was like any other child with one crucial exception. He never sinned. Can you imagine living with a brother who always obeyed his parents? Who always said the right thing in the right way and never did wrong about anything? I mean, imagine playing trivia with Jesus. I mean, can you imagine playing any game with the creator of the universe? I mean, how good at science and math and history and, and geography. Oh, yeah, yeah, I created that. <laughs> and I remember when I created Greenland. You know, that'd be really tough. And do you, what do you think James's response was? Well, he was a very human man living in a very human home with a very human brother who was also very divine. And the Bible tells us his surprising reaction. John chapter 7, verse 5, for not even his brothers were believing in him. Wow. Matthew chapter 13, verse 57, and they, talking about the people of Nazareth now, took offense at him, but Jesus said to them, a prophet is not without honor except in his hometown and in his own household. Oh. So James, like the rest of the townspeople, had this concept that any suggestion that Jesus was the promised Messiah and a Savior of the world was wrong. Twenty-one. When his own people, that's his family, heard of this, they went out to take custody of Jesus, for they were saying he's lost his senses. In other words, the brothers and sisters of Jesus were telling the townspeople, don't mind my brother, he's a little nuts. Wow. A little crazy in the head, you know? 
His own brothers and sisters thought he was so crazy that they had to go out and rescue him and bring him into custody. Imagine, let's go out and get our crazy Messiah brother. Wow. And by the way, this rejection from Jesus' own brothers and sisters may explain why, even though Jesus' brothers and sisters were alive, when Jesus is dying on the cross, he gives his mother to the Apostle John. Going against Jewish custom, she should have gone to James. We think Joseph was dead at the time. Or at least the sisters, the other brothers. John, not a family member, but a disciple. Because the rest of them didn't believe he was the Messiah. Oh, that must have pained Mary to not only see how the Romans and her fellow countrymen rejected her son, but how her own children rejected him. The children who had lived in the home with Jesus, who had witnessed his sinless life, experienced his perfect love and kindness, heard him teach, had seen him heal. And yet they rejected him. Now, the good news is they didn't stay in that unbelief. In Acts 1.14, guess what we find in the upper room with the apostles? Jesus' brothers and sisters on the day of Pentecost. Acts 1.14, these all with one mind were continually devoting themselves to prayer along with the women and Mary, the mother of Jesus, and with his brothers. Now praying believers experienced the miracle of Pentecost. Something had happened between the time of Jesus' death when none of them were believers and the time of the ascension and the Mount of Olives shortly after the day of Pentecost. Something had happened. He said, what happened? Let's take a look at James's dramatic conversion. Anybody with me? When then did James become a believer, a true follower of Jesus Christ as a personal Savior and Lord? The Gospel writers say nothing. Ah, but Paul did. In 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 3 through 8. For I delivered to you as of first importance what I also received, that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, and that he was buried, and he was raised on the third day according to the Scriptures, and that he appeared to Cephas. I know my spell check is demon-possessed. And then to the twelve. After that, he appeared to more than 500 brethren at one time, most of whom remain until now, but some have fallen asleep. Then he appeared to James. Then to all the apostles, and last of all, as it were, to one untimely born, he appeared to me, speaking of Paul. See, as far as we know, Jesus appeared to hundreds of people, all of whom were believers except two. Paul and James. Well, can you imagine what took place when the risen Lord appeared to his younger brother? I would have loved to have had a video camera, wouldn't you? And we don't know exactly what was said. We do know at that precise moment, James realized that he had not been living with a misguided human being. James realized for the first time that he, all of his life, had been living with the Lord of glory. Can you imagine the words he spoke? And he said, my Lord, oh my God. And like many of us today, James had been presented with the undeniable proof of the life and ministry of the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. But, like many of us and all of us, it took God's grace and God's mercy and the truth that set James free to become a child of God so that he can say now in verse 1 of James, James, a bondservant of God. And the Lord Jesus Christ. Don't miss the power of those simple words. In one verse, we have the only written testimony of the conversion of James. And one biblical reference. Wow. From being an unbeliever to not just being a believer, but a bond slave of God and the Lord Jesus Christ. Well, there's lots of lessons here, one of which is a message to Christian parents. And what I like to call James's life, James's life is a lesson in guiltless parenting. 
I cannot tell you how many times in my 40 plus years of ministry that I've had parents come to me agonizing because their children are not yet believers. Take the testimony of James down. Here was a man raised in the most perfect of human families. A mother like Mary who had heard the truth of the Messiahship of the Lamb of God from the time he was a little boy, raised in that, saw the miracles, heard the preaching, he was there and didn't respond. Wow. James' conversion is a reminder that no one raised in a Christian home or not can come to Christ unless the Father draws him. Jesus himself said in John 6, 44, read it with me, everybody, no one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him, and I will raise him up on the last day. All you do, parents, is provide the right atmosphere that doesn't distract from the gospel, and with the message of hope that presents the gospel, and with that desire to pursue righteousness, and you pray that God will soften your stubborn children's hearts and create in them a truth-seeking spirit and stop wallowing in your guilt. In other words, James would stand here and say, do what my parents did. Live your faith before them, share your faith with them, and leave the rest up to a sovereign Lord. Tell me, say amen, or I'll keep preaching this. Make it count, leave them all Build a name for yourself Dream your dreams, chase your heart Above all else Make a name the world remembers But all an empty world Could sell his empty dreams I got lost in the lie That it was up to me To make a name the world remembers but Jesus is the only name to remember And I, I don't want to leave a legacy I don't care if they remember me Only Jesus And I have only got one life to live I'll add every second point Jesus. All the kingdoms built, all the trophies won, will crumble into dust when it's said and done. It's all that real matters. Love is the truth, you're the ones I love. What's my life the proof that there is so
Here is a review of what we heard. Introduction to the Book of James. Written around AD 45 to the people of the 1st century. Broken into a number of sermonettes and written in an Old Testament style. Written with the theme, Faith that works walk the walk. Called the New Testament Book of Wisdom. Called the Proverbs of the New Testament. Also be called James Reflections on the Sermon on the Mount. Our text, James 1.1. 1, 1. James, a bond servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ, to the twelve tribes who are dispersed abroad, greetings. Born into the family of Joseph and Mary of Nazareth in Galilee. The first, natural-born son of the union of Mary and Joseph, with at least four brothers and two sisters. Lived with Jesus as an older brother, imagine living with a brother, God in the flesh. His surprising reaction. Jesus' brothers and sisters did not believe in him. And they took offense at him, that is, Jesus. But Jesus said to them, A prophet is not without honor except in his hometown and in his own household. And when his own people, that is, his family, heard of this, they went out to take custody of him, for they were saying, He has lost his senses. But things changed. These all with one mind were continually devoting themselves to prayer, along with the women, and Mary the mother of Jesus, and with his brothers. Please tune in next time for more of the introduction to the Epistle of James, Man with a Message, taught by Dr. Jim Cece. This has been a presentation of Global Radio Ministries and German Ministries International. KTWR, Agonia Guam. I'd like to thank you for spending time with us today. If you'd like to respond to the programs, you can email us at asiafeedback at twr.org. You can also write to TWR PO Box 6095, Marizo, Guam, 96916, USA.